you like big fish, you're in for a treat, because I'm going to show you how to catch even bigger fish. Things like this. And the good news is, you can catch them right here off Sydney. We have some extraordinary fishing right here off Sydney. We've got marlin, we've got tuna, we've got swordfish like this one, and lots more. Let me show you. This fish was hooked and caught just out here off Sydney out of a trailer boat in summer. And we have lots of fish like that. That's a marlin. And uh, as you can see, that's a pretty sizable fish. Now the striped marlin are very good to eat, but most of these fish we put a scientific research tag on them and let them go because that's a hell of a lot of fish to eat. But even back in the 1930s, in fact back to the beginning of the 19th century, uh, Sydney was renowned for huge sharks. And even back in the uh, early 1930s, the legendary writer from America, Zane Grey, was lured out to Australia just to fish for sharks. And he caught tiger sharks like that big one in the middle just here in Sydney Harbour or just out near the heads. And these ones here, they were taken just outside Sydney Heads as well. You might recognise the background there. That's Watson's Bay over near Doyle's, just inside the entrance to Sydney Harbour. And those fish were caught out here in the days when we didn't have high-powered outboards. It was just a, a, timber, a timber cruiser that probably had a top speed of about 10 knots. So they wouldn't have been charging miles out to sea like you can now. It would have been just outside the heads. And yet, they've caught striped marlin, black marlin, tiger sharks, mako sharks, and a whaler shark in one day. But Sydney also has some excellent fishing for tuna. This one's a yellowfin tuna, and we have some great fishing for yellowfin tuna at times particularly in the spring, so now, September, and then uh, September, October is a good time for yellowfin out here. And you might get lucky with a fish like that. But we also have southern bluefin tuna, which are also great to eat. We have albacore tuna, we have mackerel tuna, we have striped tuna, and we have frigate mackerel. All extremely exciting fish to catch and great to eat. Great sashimi. And if you like sashimi, you'll probably know this one as well, a yellow-tailed kingfish. There's lots of them out here on the offshore reefs. Peter Johnson earlier was t talking to you about how to catch those. And Alastair McGlashan, coming up soon, will show you how to catch fish like that inside Sydney Harbour. But if you head out to the offshore reefs, you'll find even more of them. And those aren't huge. They're nice-sized fish, but there's kingfish twice the size of that one out there. And you'll find exotics like dolphin fish or mahi-mahi. And these are beautiful fish, spectacular creatures. And they jump like a marlin. They'll race out of the water and shake and jump and fly through the air. Very exciting. They're also extremely good to eat. We catch them out here as well. And of course, sharks. This one's a mako shark, and that is one of the most extraordinary fish or sharks out in the ocean. They're built like a missile. Look how pointed it is. That is a very high-speed predator. It eats marlin and tuna, so it has to be super fast to catch them. They're cobalt blue on the back, and they're silvery on the belly. They're beautiful fish, and they jump as well. They jump out of the water higher than a marlin. I've seen them up above the roof here, like halfway to the big roof. They're extraordinary jumpers. And swordfish. Now, broadbill swordfish like this, you've probably seen these in the markets as well. They're an excellent eating fish. They're also revered as perhaps the ultimate catch for a recreational angler to try and catch. Very hard fighting, very tough, and they grow very big. That one's nearly 700 pounds over 300 kilos. We have them out here off Sydney. Now these fish were unknown until a couple of, they were unknown to, to recreational fishing until a couple of years ago. We knew the longliners caught them, 
but nobody caught more than a little one occasionally, a real rarity, until a couple of years ago. We have just discovered new techniques and using some new technology in fishing tackle, we have now found a way to catch these fish. And it's opened the floodgates to catching swordfish in the last couple of years. Now, boats are going out there and catching, or at least hooking, two or three or maybe four a day. More down in Tasmania and eastern Victoria, but it's a brand new fishery and we are discovering new grounds all the time. There are boats out of Sydney that have caught half a dozen of these this year. So we are now finding that there are good sword fishing grounds out of Sydney as well. So that's an amazing fish that you can catch here. I caught that one down in Tasmania about two months ago. And uh, there's been a lot of swordfish caught down there this year. So how do you catch these fish? These are special fish. These are the apex predators. There isn't thousands of them out there. There's quite a few. But to find them and then to catch them, to catch a fish as big as a car, it requires some thought to find them and some technology to catch them. But let me show you how. It's not that hard. But first of all, I want to point out a little bit of uh, angling theory for you. If you want to catch something really special, whether it's one of Greg's massive flathead, like a six or eight kilo flathead, or whether it's one of Peter's 10 kilo snapper or a 20 kilo mulloway, all of those enormous fish are quite possible to catch. And one way to catch them is to be patient. If you fish for a lifetime, sure enough, sooner or later, you've got a good chance of hooking one. But who wants to wait a lifetime? I don't. I want to catch one next weekend. And the good news is that the other way to catch big fish is to specifically target them. And if you do that, you will find it's not that hard. You simply learn where they live, what they eat, when they're likely to be there, and what techniques and tackle and so on you need to catch them. And if you put all that together, all of a sudden it happens. And that's why guys like Steve Starling, you see him with a massive fish every week. Because he's put all the clues together. That's why I go out and catch a swordfish and then a big tuna and then a marlin. Because we've learned how it all goes together. So let me very quickly give you some clues that will narrow your search for a really big fish from 20 years down to perhaps a couple of weekends. First of all, fish where they aggregate. You want to go where you've got the best chance, so you need to find where these fish live. And then use the techniques that are likely to get your results. Now here is a very good way to pinpoint where they're likely to be found. This is a satellite temperature chart of the ocean, of Sydney. This is Sydney here. That's Jarvis Bay down near Nowra. And that's Port Stephens up the coast a bit. So we've got a couple of hundred kilometres of coast. And this red band coming down is a river of warm water coming straight down off the Great Barrier Reef. This snapshot of the ocean was taken in April. So on that day in April, that's what the water temperature was off the coast. And if you look at the colour bar here, you'll see that the river of red warm water coming down off the Great Barrier Reef was nearly 26 degrees Celsius. That's pretty warm. But the little blue patches in close to the coast, they were down to 17 degrees. That's freezing cold. So, if we want to catch fish that we know are tropical fish, like the dolphin fish, the marlin, the tuna, we find where the water is that they're likely to be in. And this is the East Australian Current, or the EAC. Now your kids will be able to tell you all about that because it was in Finding Nemo. I don't know if there's any packs of uh, talking turtles in that river, but I do know that there is lots of tropical fish. So if I was heading out off Sydney looking for tropical species on this day, 
If I'm in close here, the water's going to be 18 or 19 degrees. That's too cold. I'm wasting my time. But if I head out a little bit further, I'm now on the edge of that tropical water and I'm in with a really good chance of finding those fish. So that helps, but there's a few other clues. If, I'll go back, if you're down at the beach and you're in nice warm water and you're having a swim and it's all good, and then, oh, you hit a cold patch of water and it's freezing. You ever done that? And then you step back into the warm. The same thing happens with fish. The warm tropical species fish will be coming down in this river and they will get to the edge and they will go into the cooler water. Now if there's a strong edge, if it goes from sort of 25 degrees down to 21 in a short area, that's a very significant temperature drop. And that'll be like you stepping into that frigid water. They will back up too and they will sit on that edge. And then another fish comes along and he hits it. Woo, he backs up. And then another fish and he backs up. All of a sudden you've got a whole bunch of fish accumulating on the edge of that current. It's like a fence. So that edge is a very good place to find an aggregation of these sort of fish. But there's more we can do. This is the same sort of temperature chart but now I've got an overlay of the current speed and the current direction. Now these are commercially available programs that you can rent the service on the internet and it will show you all this and every day is different. It'll show you what's happening that day. Now the length of the arrows shows the strength of the current, how fast the water's moving. And the arrow direction of course is showing you which way it's moving. So have a look at this. We've got long arrows here coming down the coast. That's strong current. And here we've got tiny little arrows, so there's almost no current. And you've heard of eddies. Well, here you can see is a spiralling whirlpool of the East Australian current. And there's another one down here. And there's a bit of action going on out the side. So we start to get a picture of what's going on in the ocean how fast the current's flowing. We can also overlay it with another section of data which shows you the bottom contours. Now, this is like a topographic map and the contour lines show you the changes in depth. So out here where you've got very spread lines, the, the bottom is quite flat. But all of this dark edges here, that's showing the edge of the continental shelf. That's where Australia drops off into the ocean. And this edge here is like a cliff edge. It's like the Blue Mountains, but it's out there on the bottom under the sea. That's very significant for finding fish. This little clump of black lines here is showing a sea mountain, a sea mountain like a little spike coming up off the bottom, probably an old volcano. And these dark patches here with lots of compressed lines, that's the cliff edge where the continental shelf runs along the coast. Now, for a fisherman chasing oceanic fish, that's very important because when those current flow hits a cliff edge, it bounces up. You get what we call an upwelling. And upwellings are important. So we look at the direction of the current. And if that current is flowing into a cliff edge, it hits and then bounces up and we get an upwelling. The upwelling stirs up nutrients from down in the dark, deep depths of the ocean. Little broken up pieces of dead fish that floated down and they just gunge on the bottom. And that gungy bits of nothing gets washed up in the current and brought to the surface. When it gets to the surface, there are plankton. Plankton don't live down in the dark depths, or the phytoplankton don't. They need sunlight. And when these nutrients get taken to the surface, the plankton eat those nutrients and they breed and they proliferate. So now we've got a plankton boom on the surface. That then is prime food for little bait fish. 
So the little bait fish come and eat the plankton. Then the bait fish aggregate. And then the bigger fish that eat the little bait fish, they come and they eat them. And then the bigger fish that eat those ones, they come. And you can see where that ends up. The big oceanic predators, they are looking for food and they aggregate and they hang around where all of this is going on. And that is where it's going on. And you end up with this. We're now out in the open ocean and we have a school of sardines, pilchards, and they are eating the plankton and they are aggregating along that drop-off because that's where the upwellings are. The marlin or the tuna or the dolphin fish or whatever else, they come and then they find them and then they stay there so they now aggregate. So if you know what the current's doing and you know what the bottom structure is, you then find these. And now you have found the needle in the haystack. But there is other clues. Who could tell me for a prize? I've got a bunch of prizes here for you. Who could tell me another really good clue that will show you where the fish are? Who said that? The young lady here. Come on up, you've got a prize. Would you like a nice cobia hat to go with your cobia boat over there? Good on you. And better than that, I'm going to give you a copy of Blue Water magazine because that teaches you all about this stuff. There you go. All right, she said birds. Now, birds is an excellent clue. Let me show you why. Here is the scenario I was telling you about. We've got a school of bait fish. In this case, we've got a whole pack of sailfish. There's lots of them there. This is not Sydney. But they could be tuna or they could be marlin, which we do get off Sydney. And here we've got a pack of sardines. The big fish are rounding that school of bait fish up in a tight pack, which we call a bait ball, because they're bait fish and they're packed into a ball. The next thing those predators do, whether they're tuna or marlin or sailfish, they will round up those fish and force them to the surface. Who can tell me why they would do that? <laughs> Good idea. What part of the hunting strategy is assisted by forcing them to the surface? Pretty much, yeah, have a copy of Blue Water. They've narrowed it down. What I was looking for is the bait fish are trapped. The big fish wheel around underneath and here you can see one of these sailfish has just come through the bottom of the pack. He's not going through the middle, he's not making them all shatter and go in all directions. He's just plucking one off the bottom. And these guys will come around, they'll have a go and they'll pluck one off the bottom. By forcing that school to the surface, they are trapped. They can't go anywhere. They can't fly. So it's just made it easier for the big fish to catch them. But that's great, because now the seabirds have a chance to catch them. And all of this is going on underneath the surface, and we can't see that. You won't know that there's 20 sailfish there by driving your boat along. You might not know that there's a big packet of a big pack of sardines there either. But if you see the seabirds all aggregated together and wheeling and diving, you do know what's underneath the surface. And that scenario is going on right now in Sydney Harbour. The tailor do that. The Australian salmon do that. All of these sort of surface predators, pelagic species, they will hunt bait fish like this and the birds know it. They make a living out of flying around in the sky looking for this to go on. And they can see a whole lot more up there than we can see from the boat. So one of the best strategies for you is to get yourself in the area by looking at the currents and the direction and the, the bathymetric chart to find out where the bottom contours are and then look up in the sky and watch for the birds. And that's what you might find going on underneath. That's a yellowfin tuna bursting through that packet of, pack of bait fish. Now, 
all seabirds are not created equal. You need to know a little bit about your birds. Or put it this way, if you do, you will catch more fish quicker. And that's what I'm trying to teach you here is to shortcut the hunt, to take it from a once in a lifetime catch to a once a month catch or a once a weekend catch. This is how you do it. Know your seabirds. Who can tell me what sort of bird that is? Yeah. No. No, good guess, but no. Any others? A gannet, well done. You got a copy of Blue Water too. Congrats, I won't come out because I might get feedback off the speakers, but well done. Okay, another prize. Who can tell me another name, common name, worldwide, for gannets? Same bird, different name. Anyone? Cormoran. Great guess, but no. Anyone else? It's a funny name. Boobies. <laughs> well done. That's called a booby. Did you got a prize before, didn't you? No? Here we go. One for you as well. Oh, she's got one. There you go. Maybe she'll let you read it. Know your seabirds. It will help you. Now, the reason you need to know your seabirds is because they have two very different ways of hunting. And it helps if you know which kind of bird you're looking for and where. Also, there are plenty of seabirds that are not going to help you at all because they don't eat what the fish eat. Seagulls are a well-known seabird. Are they going to help you to find marlin or tuna? No. Are they going to help you to find someone's packet of chips that they threw? Yes. All right, seagulls are useless. They'll help you find Taylor in Sydney Harbour, but they're not going to help you catch marlin or tuna. This is one kind of bird that really will help you. Who can tell me? For a prize, what is it? You've had a go. Turn, well done. Guy up the back eating seagull food. You want a copy of Blue Water? There we go. Pass that back to me if you would. Well done, that's a turn. Now turns are very important. You can pick a turn because he's got raked wings. They're swept back like a boomerang because they're quite fast flyers. They've also got a forked tail and a long pointed beak for grabbing fish. Now they're important because they eat medium sized bait fish. The same sort of bait fish that tuna would eat or certainly small tuna. So by finding turns we find the bait fish that the fish we want to catch are also looking for. It all goes together. How do terns hunt? What's their hunting modus operandi? No, <laughs> I won't say what you said. <laughs> Anyone else tell me? Come on, you guys, you've got to win a prize. Up high, is that what you said? Up high, looking. Spot on, come on up, you've got a prize. Copy of Blue Water for you. That'll give you a lot more clues too. Terns, like some other seabirds, including the gannets, the boobies that you saw before, they fly around up high because they hunt with their eyes, their sight feeders. So they're up high in the sky looking because that gives them a better view. Okay, so we look for them up there. This guy is also very good at finding fish, but that's a completely different bird. Who can tell me what that is? A hawk? Missed it. No. No? Mutton bird. Yeah, well done. I don't know who got that right, but here you go. There's a couple of copies. Passed him up back there somewhere. That's, uh, that's a shearwater or a mutton bird and there's actually several different species of brown seabird that you'll find out here and they're good they, they eat bait fish the sort of bait fish that our predators want to eat too so they're worth looking for but they hunt completely differently now other than the fella down here who could tell me how they hunt not you you've got a copy <laughs> you're just too clever 
sitting on top of the water. No. 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 Not stick the head in the water. No. Anyone else? <laughs> they will eat your bait, yes. Someone said it. They skim the water. I don't know who that was, but you're right. They skim the water. They are flying right down low. Now, if you've seen mutton birds or the other species that like this out there, they will fly very close to the swell. In fact, they're amazing flyers because they'll skim the water so close that their feathers are touching the water and they'll bank and wheel and weave through the swells and over the chop. They are incredible flyers. But why would they do that? Why would they fly down so low, so close that they risk getting smacked into a wave? Why would they do that? Can't hear. Mm, yeah, you, but no. They probably do get assistance from the, the air currents on the water, but the reason they do it is because they're not looking. They're smelling. They are sniffing. And they keep very close to the water because they are tube nose seabirds. They have large nostrils. And there's types of seabirds that birders, fanatics who just like going and finding seabirds, they call them tube noses because these birds hunt with their sense of smell. So they hang right down low to the water and they smell for the scent of fish or little bait fish. And if tuna are breaking through a school of sardines or other little fish, the oil and the blood will get broken up and come to the surface and then these birds will smell it and then they'll track it down like bloodhounds and then you will end up with that. So again, keep your eye out. Now the white birds, like the terns and the gannets and so on, they will be up high usually and so they're easier to see. But keep your eye out down low to the water for the often brown coloured birds like mutton birds, shearwaters, petrels, because they will also be great indicators of where the fish action is. As you can see, there's a little yellowfin tuna that's just busted out eating a bait fish. Okay, so what do these fish eat? The game fish that we want to catch, what do they eat? Well, they have preferences. The larger ones, like the marlin, and, uh, well, marlin especially, but the bigger tuna, they will love eating small tuna, little skipjack tuna or striped tuna of one or two kilos, prime bait. But they'll eat lots of other stuff too. They'll eat, or they love to eat, things like slimy mackerel, yellowtail, cow and young, and that sort of thing, flying fish. But I put this slide in just to show you that these fish often don't have a lot of choice. They might have a preference. They might prefer to eat a mackerel or a small tuna. But when you're out on the open ocean in the middle of nowhere, and don't forget these these things are riding a river that could be a hundred miles off the coast, out in deep water, middle of nowhere. They often will starve to death if they get too choosy. And so they will eat pretty much whatever they can find if it looks half edible. This is the stomach contents taken out of a dolphin fish, one of those beautiful gold and blue fish I showed you. And that was caught in 80 fathoms off Port Stephens, just up the road here. In its stomach, that's a 14 kilo fish, so 30 pounds, it's about a bit over a metre long. In it was a baby dolphin fish, so it's a cannibal, it's eating a small one. A trevally, fairly decent sized trevally. That's an octopus, don't know where he found that. That's a puffer fish, a little toad. That's a leather jacket with a great big spike on the top of it. And that is a nautilus which is like a, an oceanic octopus that lives inside a shell. That's a pretty random mix of food. But it shows you that these predators out on the open ocean are often, they're, they're opportunistic. So they'll eat whatever they come across. Okay, now that helps a little bit because that might help to explain why 
that kind of lure is the most successful or one of the most successful ways to catch them. They're pretty crazy looking things, bright colours, they don't look anything like a real fish, but they are deadly effective. A couple of reasons why. They are the right profile. They're long and slim, the profile of a mackerel or a flying fish or a yellowtail. So if you get a glimpse of one up as you're looking up through the water and there's this profile, it's the right shape. The colours, and especially a black lure like that, gives you great contrast against the surroundings. And so now it stands out from the surroundings. And like I said, they are opportunistic. If you can make your lure stand out and get noticed, a lot of these fish will just race over and have a bite because they're hungry. And they'll say, if it looks half reasonable, I'll have a go. Don't forget they can spit it out. They'll have a bite. They'll test it. But if you've got a razor sharp hook in the tail end, they have, might have a test bite. Bang, you got him on. They are very successful lures. They also have a cut face or a sliced face that is designed to splash on the surface and grab a pocket of air that, in, that sits in a vacuum around the head and then that bubble of air dissipates and trails behind the lure like a smoke trail of little micro bubbles. We call it a smoke trail. And that makes a little lure this big into a lure 10 metres long, just from the bubbles. And again, that helps them get noticed. It's a bit like the jet that's flying up high on a, on a humid day. You don't see the jet, but you do see the vapour trail. And then you follow the vapour trail up and, oh look, there's a jet, a little tiny silver thing. I wouldn't have seen that. But you find it because you saw the vapour trail. These lures do exactly that. So that, there's a lot more I can tell you, but that will give you a few clues. And if you get some lures like this, if you troll them in those sort of areas, looking for those sort of clues, you will catch tuna, you will catch marlin, you will catch dolphin fish this summer out here off Sydney. And if you'd like to know more about it, I've got a whole bunch of blue water magazines here, and it's full of just that. That's what we do, is we teach people how to catch these fish. So if you're interested, I'm going to duck over the back of the stage here now. Please come and see me. Happy to answer any of your questions and I'll give you a copy of Blue Water. And I'd love to see you back here next year and show me your photo. And I bet the photo weighs 10 kilos. <laughs> Thanks, guys.